There are times when I see the things that are happening in our world in terms of people turning away from God and turning to godliness and turning to idols of this world. People openly declaring their disdain for God. What is it? What value are you adding to this world that makes you so important? How to thrive in Babylon. I think a lot of times today, I, I got some texts this past week from people who are upset about different things that are going on in the news. And one of my best advice for people when they call me and say, Neil, did you see the news? I say, no, I didn't because of the fact that I was not, um, I was not aware of what's going on. And because I was not aware of what's going on, I just missed it and so they'll be they'll be telling me oh this went on in the news and this went on in the news and they're so upset about it and they said do you have any advice and I'm like yeah turn off the news <laughs> but there are a lot of things that are going on in this world that are disturbing there are a lot of things that are going on in this world that are difficult for us to comprehend why in the world is God letting these things happen if there was ever a time where we feel like we are living in a world that is not our own anymore, I, I, especially from people that are of my generation, um, we are all thinking that the world is changing so fast and so rapidly that it's not something we even recognize anymore. And so today we begin this series on Daniel and we're going to be talking about how to thrive, not just survive Babylon, but how to thrive in Babylon. We want to talk to you over the next several weeks on how to deal with all the changes that are going on in the world. If you open up your sermon notes, the first thing I want you to see in your sermon notes about the book of Daniel is Daniel means God will judge. The book of Daniel, when you read Daniel's name, you will see that it means God will judge. Now, I was happened to think about this having the name Daniel and how would you like it if every morning you got up out of bed and your parents said, God will judge? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you have a little stigma to you when, you, when every time your, your mom and dad called you for dinner, you would, you know, you're running behind or whatever, God will judge. Every time you did something wrong, God will judge. I mean, that's a tough name to live with, Amen. And we got to think about this in terms of Daniel, because he lived in a time where names meant a lot. And poor Daniel was living with the name God will judge. But I think Daniel lived in such a way that when he, he heard his name called, he was reminded that God is going to judge. So as you study through the book of Daniel with me, as we go through this together, I want you to always remember when you hear the word Daniel is that God will judge. You see, a lot of times in this world, we have a lot of different things happening to us. And we have to kind of sometimes take it, right? Sometimes things happen, we just have to take it. And but at the end of the day, God will judge what's right and what's wrong and whether or not we did what was right and wrong. In Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, this is going to be our main text this morning. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Don't you just like that word? He besieged it. Not even sure what besieging it means, but he besieged it. He took over the city. Now, from what I understand from a historical standpoint, this was the first besiege that took place. Uh, I understand, and I'm doing some checking on this. I uh, actually got a text about it today, but there was another time when Nebuchadnezzar was on his way to conquer Jerusalem and his father died and he had to go back to Babylon in order to make sure that his power was, his uh, uh, authority was still intact. And he had that happening to him. And so, but this is the, the second time, but it says in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Now, 
If you know what these articles are, we'll, we'll read more about those later on. If you're not familiar with them, you can go and find out more about them in 2 Kings. But it says, the articles from the temple of the God, these he carried off to the temple of his gods in Babylon and put the treasures in the house of his God. Then there ordered uh, Ash, uh, Pene, Pedaz, uh, I'm sorry, Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The kings assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were entered into the king's service. Now, I've got some observations here. Now, I, I don't know about how you would feel about this, but I can imagine that in those days when Nebuchadnezzar came in, and Nebuchadnezzar came in, not only took the king, but he took some of the young men, and he did this in such a way that these young men were going to be going off to Babylon. And the reason why he did this, he took the king and he took everybody, because he's thinking, well, if I've got all of these young men over here, these people in Jerusalem, they're going to behave. They're going to absolutely behave because we've got some of their kinfolk over here. We've got their king over here. And then to make sure you behave, we're going to take the sacred articles from your temple and we're going to put them in our temple with our gods. We're going to let you know who's in charge. I got to tell you, in today's world where they're kicking God out of the schools and every place else, sometimes it feels like Nebuchadnezzar has come in and won. There are times when I see the things that are happening in our world in terms of people turning away from God and turning to godliness and turning to idols of this world. People openly declaring their disdain for God. I believe sometimes I feel like I'm living under Nebuchadnezzar. The reason why I point this out to you is because it must have been very difficult for the people of Israel to continue in their faith because they were saying, look, everything that we know about God has been taken away from us. Every article that was in our most holy of holy temples has been taken away and put in the temple of another God. It looked like God was losing, amen? And sometimes today it looks like God is losing so let's look at some observations here number one God is always sovereign God is always sovereign Jeremiah chapter 25 verses 1 through 11 talks about and predicts the fall of Jerusalem predicts Jeremiah has been called the weeping prophet and the reason why Jeremiah was the weeping prophet is because of the fact that he predicted and he preached about what was going to happen to the Israelites and they would not listen they would not sustain uh, their faith in God instead they were doing all the things that were against God and they were trying their best to do a, a live a life of whatever they wanted to do versus what God wanted to do and Jeremiah comes in and he continues over and over again to say, hey, you're about to be destroyed. You're about to be overrun. And in all of this, it says the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. I want you to underline the words, the Lord delivered. Because a lot of times we see things happening in this world and we wonder why they happened. Just yesterday, we were talking about the, uh, or listening on the uh, news and everywhere else about 9-11, it being the 20th year of 9-11. And there is a lot of times that when we look at this and, and we say to ourselves, how did this happen? How did this bad thing happen to us? And I'm here to tell you that the Lord, a lot of times, delivered things the way that, that He does. Number two, the way Babylon works is the way the world still works today. The first thing that I want you to see, letter A, is they dishonored God. It says they dishonored God. 
some of the articles of the temple of God, these he carried off in the temple of God in Babylon and put the treasures, uh, put, put in, his, in, in the treasure house of his gods. I'm sorry, I'm not able to see today. So you can see there they dishonored God by taking away the temple, the things of the temple. Today we've got a lot of ways that we're being, God is being dishonored and, and so forth. Letter B, they valued status, youth, and looks, and brains. They valued status, youth, look, and brains. Now, is there anybody in here that thinks that we don't value that stuff today? The older I get, the more I realize that I am not valued anymore. And the reason why I'm not valued is because I'm not young anymore. And I, I'm going to tell you, at one time, I was a good-looking man. Some of y'all don't believe that, but it's true. I have a wife that called me a hunk when she met me, okay? So she can tell you way back when I was a hunk. Not anymore, but I was a hunk. And, and you got to see here that we, we, have, we have a society here that values status. I have yet to figure out what the Kardashians do that makes them so important. Have you? I cannot figure it out. I look at a lot of the celebrities on TV and, and so forth, and I'm trying to figure out, all right, what is it, what value are you adding to this world that makes you so important that we've got to see you in your bikini? I don't get it. And we are, we as a nation, we are valuing status, youth, looks, and brains. It says, from the royal family... The nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed and quick to understand. Look, look at what it says next. Number three, we are being indoctrinated just like the Israelites. It says in, the, in, in their verse, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. If you don't think we're being indoctrinated today, you are severely mistaken. I had an opportunity this past uh, weekend at SunQuest. We were spending time together with one of the college students that was over there, and she had a notebook, and she had a list of questions that she was asking Lance and I, how do you answer this? I remember when my kids were coming to school, going to school, and they were coming up uh, the theory of evolution versus the theory of creation, and that was the way it was being taught. And I remember having to sit down with them, and I said, "Look, you've got to give the teacher the answer that they want, but you've got to realize what the truth is." And today we're being indoctrinated over and over with what's going on in the world. You see. In the world today, or in Babylon, it is about me and what I can get. In God's eyes, it's about others. In Babylon, it's about loving themselves. In God's eyes, it's about loving people. In Babylon, it's about getting all you can, and in, in God's eyes, it's denying yourself. In Babylon, it's about getting. In God's eyes, it's about giving. In Babylon, it's about the here and now. In God's eyes, it's about eternity. And we're constantly being indoctrinated in those things. Number four, ba Babylon wants us to adapt to it. Babylon wants us to adapt to what's going on in the world today. It doesn't want us to be countercultural. And the world is leading, is leading us in a, in a direction that we should not want to go. It says, the king assigned to them daily amounts of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were entered into the king's service. Nebuchadnezzar's plan was to change, number one, their environment. Change their environment. Take them away from what they know and put them in another place. That's happening today with our kids that are going off to, to the secular schools that are out there in the world. It's happening everywhere we turn. Recently, I was online, I was doing my emails and looking at some stuff, and one of the things that I noticed in my emails is that I was getting a lot of advertisement for nightgowns. 
And I'm thinking to myself, I've not looked at nightgowns. Why am I getting advertisement for nightgowns? You know, there is a formula in your computer, and I don't know how all this works, but there is a formula in your computer where if you look at something, it will tell you what, what you're looking at. I looked at foosball tables one day. Guess what I'm getting ads for? Foosball tables. And I understand that. But I could not figure out for the life of me why I was getting emails and things on the web about nightgowns. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I do not wear nightgowns to bed. <laughs> so I went to Nancy and I asked her, have you been shopping for nightgowns on my computer? And guess what? She did it. <laughs> now, nightgowns are just one of the ways that the web and other people are using to indoctrinate us. It's not just nightgowns. It's also the media that you read and the things that you look at. It is the things that you see on TV constantly. It is the music that you hear. It is everything in your environment is trying to take you away from God unless it's intentionally trying to take you towards God. Number two, education. And I feel bad for the kids that are in public schools right now because it is just a mess for them. I was listening to uh, one of the teenagers this morning. I was teaching the teen class, and one of the teenagers was telling me that he goes to school, but everything he does is online. He hadn't written anything with his hand in a long time. And the reason for that is if they have to go into quarantine, they can just keep on doing schoolwork without coming in. And so it's a very difficult time, but it's not just a difficult time because of the pandemic. It's also a difficult time because the schools and, and the things that they're going to be getting indoctrinated with right now are taking them further and further away from God. Number three is culture. And one of the things that disturbs me is that the church is not influencing culture, but culture is influencing the church. I'm watching it happen over and over again in the different churches that are trying to take a stand, a biblical stand on what is right and what is wrong. And the culture is coming after them saying, no, you can't do that. You can't say that. And number four is the names. They change their names. And you can look at that in verses six and seven where they change their names and Daniel to Belshazzar and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego becomes the names of men who had godly names. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because of the fact that, well, nobody has come along and tried to change my name from Neil, except for I had a French teacher that wanted to call me Philippe all the time. I hated that. But I can tell you what is going on in the world today, and I'm witnessing it firsthand. They're trying to change our kids' identity. They no longer are calling boys boys and girls girls. They're no longer allowing us to be male and female like God created us. Instead, you can choose your identity, and they're messing with the minds of our kids right now. And if you don't believe it's happening Trust me, I know firsthand that it's happening. If you look on the very back of your sermon notes, you'll see the names and what they meant. And you can see that Daniel was God my judge, and it was changed to Baal will protect, which was a god of Babylon. Uh, Hanahi, Yahweh has been gracious, or Yah has been gracious. And then inspired a Yaku is Shadrach, which is another god. Who is what God is, is turned to belong to Akku. And then Yah or Yahweh has helped, has true, turned to serving, servant of Nebo. And in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we have this command. Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. 
to the patterns, be transformed by the renewing of your minds, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I've got this down here too, and I want you to see this. Don't become so well-adjusted. This is from the Message Bible. To your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Ready, readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to the level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-performing maturity in you. This lesson this morning, I want to leave you with the fact that we are in a battle. We are in a battle to survive Babylon. And I wish I could say with confidence that the world's going to change and things are going to go back, but I can't tell you that. As a matter of fact, and I'm trying not to be pessimistic about this, but as the world continues to surround itself with an anti-God culture, I think the church is going to come over under attack. But until it comes under attack, we have to be the people that God calls us to be. We have to be this light in the world, and we have to know how to stand up to the things that are going on around us. This is the introduction. I've told you all the bad news. Come back next week and we'll see how to handle, how to not just survive Babylon, but thrive in Babylon. We sing the Lord's invitation every uh, first day of the week. We sing that invitation as an opportunity for you to respond to it. If there is a need at all, please come as we stand and sing.